All right, God bless you. Good evening. We are so glad to be here. We praise God from whom all blessings flow. And certainly I am uh, uh, enjoying this study of Zechariah, and I hope you are too. Um, I think we have one more minor prophet to go after Zechariah, which would be Malachi. And I can hardly believe it. We began this journey now some uh, years ago, and look at what God has done. I hope that you <laughs> have been blessed and helped, and I hope that the message of the prophets, uh, these minor prophets, these 11 men so far that we've talked about, and then when we get to Malachi, number 12, will have made a, a real difference in your life. I was speaking to, uh, I believe, Dr. Heather Clark a few days ago, and Minister Paul Metallus, and I just mentioned them because in ministry, I, I spend a little time, I, I, Minister Paul literally uh, helps get me from point A to point B. I spend most of the time administratively with Dr. Heather Clark, so we're always talking about various aspects of it. And, and one day in preparing for Bible study, I, I happened to say to her, I said, you know, I, Dr. Clark, I didn't say Dr. Clark, I called about a miller named Diane. I said, you know, the, the more I've engaged these minor prophets, the more I see the simplicity of God in trying to reach his people, Israel. I guess last week when we talked about uh, the call of Israel to rejoice and the call of Israel to sing and be glad because of those four things that the hope of Jesus Christ brought to them or will bring to them uh, messianically as the uh, Messiah and Savior of the world, both literally and figuratively for them and then for us as believers in the Christ that these 11 men 12 men will be completed uh, again really had a very simple message and let me uh, try and give a summation before we begin tonight and then we'll pray and we're going to be in Zechariah chapter 2 and we're going to be looking at I believe verse 11 tonight we we need to complete the section of verses uh uh, uh, <laughs> uh 10 11 12 and 13 so hopefully we can get that done uh tonight and uh, god will bless us but the simple message of the prophetic books have simply been this that god loves his people israel and and i mean all of them from the northern uh tribes who were judah to um, israel to the two who made up the southern nation of Judah, God loved them. It is apparent that within the two of them, that the error that they continued to make over and over again, first starting in the north, with the worship center being set up, not for the people to come to Jerusalem to worship, but them setting up a false worship system in the north of Israel, and they began to worship golden calves, etc., and things that were not like God. That it offended God. It offended the core of God. Because if you remember for this people, he delivered them for uh, one very specific reason. He said to Moses that uh, you would know that I've sent you to deliver my people from bondage when they come to this mountain and worship me. During the presentation of the Decalogue there at Mount Sinai, God gave that first great ominous exaltation to his people as a nation. He says, I'm a jealous God, and what I don't want you to do, I don't want you to have any other God before me. Don't make an image like it. Don't bow down yourself to it, etc. I, I won't have it. So as time went by, that's exactly what they did. When, uh, when the kingdom was divided, uh, the northern part, those ten tribes away from the two in the south, that worship system set up. They began to worship that false system, false prophets, etc. And it angered God, so God sent Assyria to bring Israel, the northern kingdoms, into captivity. Well, Judah in the south, in the meantime, became arrogant and did some of the things that we exalted us to do about the first week of this month, lesson number one for the month of September, where we reminded us that when your enemy is having trouble, don't you gloat because God may hear it and turn what you were gloating over them over, that same wheel that you were pushing to crush them, it has the ability to turn around and crush you. And so it wasn't long 
before Judah began making the same type of spiritual errors that their brothers and sisters Judah, Israel had made in the north. What was it? They started to uh, get away from the true worship of God. They started to believe the report of false prophets rather than to believe the words of true prophets who was trying their best to turn their hearts back to God and away from all of their idolatry and their rebellion. So Jeremiah and others tried so hard, and we'll get maybe to Jeremiah's lesson one day, but, but, but those prophets who prophesied to Judah, uh, who, who, who warned them over and over that God is going to allow the Babylonians to come, they did Assyria to the north, and if you would just repent, God would turn Nebuchadnezzar. He'll go back. But they did not. And you know the story. Then as uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord, to do you good, not evil, to bring you to a good place. God wanted to bless them. It, Babylon won his plan, but because of false worship, rebellion, adultery, misuse, and mistreatment of themselves, God used a man like Nebuchadnezzar to be his chastening rod to bring Judah to captivity as Assyria had taken Israel in the north. And now God's people have been scattered to the four winds of the earth, if you will, simply because they refused to do, in my opinion, the first thing that God asked them never to do. And that's it. And that God always was going to keep his word to bring them into a place of promise. He was always going to give. That God wasn't going to lie to himself. Some way, somehow, God was going to settle them in Jerusalem. It was going to be his place. The temple was going to be the object of worship. Some way, somehow, God was going to work this out. God was going to make it happen. So he started releasing them to come back to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the walls, rebuild the gates. Thank you, Nehemiah and Ezra and others who led those, Zerubbabel, all of those wonderful men who led those groups of people out of captivity, coming back to reestablish the priesthood, the systems, the sacrifices that would honor God. And yes, after 70 years, God, God then used uh, uh, Medo-Persia to chastise Babylon for their mistreatment of his people. And we talked already about one of the visions of, uh, of, uh, of Zechariah was that then God would then address the powers who address the powers who address the powers to be used. Remember this again? God just used those four powers as his hand because he loved his people and wanted them back in fellowship with him so bad. And that is the summation of, I believe, the minus prophets uh, plead to the people and then always pointing us to the ultimate one of the Messiah who would come to make all things right not just for Israel but for all nations and for the whole world and I believe that's what these uh, these studies of the minor prophets have taught this preacher in, in my simplicity just God always saying don't and they did then they did and then God did but God refused to let them make him a lie. So God kept his word to himself in spite of what they did over and over. Sounds like us, huh? Hmm? Sounds like us, huh? Oh, okay, okay. When I when I hear that summation, it sounds like Ariel Manaway, senior. Mm-hmm. There have been so many times I, I've known the word of God, know what God expected. And in spite of knowing what God expected, knowing what God said, I have errored. And God has sundry times in my life used an Assyria, used a Babylon, just trying to say God's hand has been upon me, my life, ministry, and everything and to realize and took me to some dry places in order for me to long for the presence of of his power and his spirit to be present in my life as it once was. Oh, I tell you, getting back to your spiritual, your figurative Jerusalem should be the goal of all of us tonight. I asked us just a week ago, is God now experiencing the best version of who you are? And if not, make that commitment to do that. God use the most efficient part of me as you can for your glory 
but for our good. All right. So that's about 10 minutes I talked, but that was on my heart. And I just wanted to make sure that as we studied the word of God, that we were really doing what we needed to do and what would honor God. Let's pray and we'll engage uh, chapter 2, verse 11 tonight for sure. Hopefully we'll get to uh, uh, verses 12 and 13 as well and finish up this particular part of the study of, uh, of Zechariah. By your heads. Eternal God, thank you so much for the privilege to open your word and to look into the mirror of your word. Not a window, but a mirror. Thank you for showing ourselves in light of your relationship to your people, Israel, years past. But we see us. And now, Lord, forgive us for our transgressions. Forgive us for our idolatry. Forgive us for our rebellious spirits and hearts. And continue to conform us into the likeness of your son. May we be intentional about decreasing from our godliness. From our godlessness, rather. And may we increase in our godliness. Please help us. So let us hear truth tonight, principles and lessons to live by. We'll give you glory for what you're about to say to us for our good. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Okay. Um, chapter 2, verse 11. Now, in quick review, in case you were not with us last week and you're trying to get caught up, uh, we simply rehearsed uh, chapter 2, verse 10, and it was under the title of A Call to Israel to Sing and Rejoice. And there were four reasons for Israel to sing and rejoice, and the theme was hope. H-O-P-E. Paul in the New Testament talks about that when we can see something, that's not really hope. That means we see it. But a real hope is something that you can't see, but yet you still have hope or an expectation for. Got it? So sometimes hope is defined uh, by my little simple uh, uh, vocabulary and glossary, if you will. An expectation that it has a cherished desire to be fulfilled. That's what I call hope. An expectation, which is my cherished desire to be fulfilled. Hope. What were those four things? Well, it was um, in the context of Jesus as Messiah and his second coming and what that would mean to individuals and to nations. First of all, we said that the second coming of Christ to the earth is the hope of the nation of Israel. Secondly, we declare that the second coming of Christ is the era of hope for the church, not just for a nation, for a people, but for the church, the body of Christ. Thirdly, we said that the hope of the physical earth is the coming, the second coming of Christ that will be on the earth. <laughs> uh, I, I laughed many times and uh, when I was a little boy, the Jehovah Witnesses used to, used to come by our house every day. Matter of fact, I had some friends who lived down the street from us who lived right next door almost to the Antioch Baptist Church growing up as a child. It was the Barnes family and they were very faithful Seventh-day Adventists. I have to admit that I had an attraction for for uh, Brother Barnes' and sister. So uh, uh, me at that teenage, uh, uh, those teenage years being attractive and having my first experiences with love and attraction, uh, I would follow them to, on Saturdays to go to the Seventh Day Adventist service. But I learned some very important things uh, about that doctrine, about that culture, and about that community of Seventh Day Adventists, how they were faithful to uh, keep the Sabbath, how his mother would prepare on Friday so there was not much to do on Saturday but to attend church and fellowship with other worshipers. Uh, their attention to the kind of music they listened to, their attention to the kind of diet that they would eat. They observed so many of the things of orthodoxy for Seventh-day Adventists. And so I, I learned some things uh, about uh, that, 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 that seventh day and how they went about uh, to keep it holy in their opinion. But their second coming was for the church. Um, Christ coming back 
to the, the earth for the church. And then thirdly, there was the hope of the physical earth for the second coming of Christ and how one day he will come back again in bodily form. And then fourthly, the second coming of Christ is the hope of all nations. The hope of all nations. All right. So before we get to the main topic of the night, uh, which concerns verse 11, which will be spoke or presented to us under the title of uh, the beneficiary uh, results of Christ's return. What is the benefit of Christ's return? What would those benefits be like when Christ comes back again? Well, let's read verse 11. It reads, And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts have sent me unto thee. Isn't that powerful? Here's a possible connection and meaning and uh, a narrative for verse 11. It reads, And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, meaning that the gospel will be preached to all nations. And multitudes will be converted and embrace the profession of the Christian faith and join themselves to the church of Jesus Christ, which is in the New Testament, it is expressed by being joined to the Lord. Now, we get that expression from New Testament passages such as Acts chapter 5, verse 13, and Old Testament passages such as Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 5. But let's look again here at this talking about in the gospel. It talks about how uh, many will be joined to the Lord, will be converted and be embraced under the Christian faith. In this document, it really says religion, but I, I, I prefer you than the Christian faith. And so open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 24, and let's just look for a moment at uh, what that wonderful gospel says about the power of the gospel being preached and in the, the last day people being joined to Christ, all right? Here we go. Uh, it says in verse 3, Jesus went out and sat down on the Mount of Olives, and disciples came to him privately, saying, uh, tell us uh, these things, when should these things be, and what should be the signs of your coming? Got it? And of the ends of the earth. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name. Look at your Bible, y'all. Saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Ye shall be, uh, see that ye be not troubled, rather, it says. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This is the King James uh, rendering of the text. Verse 7. For nations shall rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Mm. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Remember verse 11. The gospel will be preached in all nations, and multitudes will be converted and will embrace the profession of Christians. Verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to the, be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And here it is, verse 14. Remember here in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 11. It says again, the gospel will be preached in all nations and multitudes will be converted and embrace Christ. Verse 14, Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end 
come. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Then shall the end come. So here Zechariah is really talking about something that Jesus himself will say later on and, and reminding us that, uh, that everything is about God continuing to try not only just to save a nation or a people, Israel, but to save spiritual Israel. Those of us who have been imputed the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all those who've gone before, who really had a faith in the Lord and what he would do, even through the prophets, giving the Messiah him coming, who would trust Jesus Christ? God will make sure that in all the world, in all nations, that that's gospel, the life God helped me, the life and sacrifice of his son, the propitiation of our faith, the scapegoat for our unrighteousness, the one who became sin for us, who did not sin, uh, the one who was tempted in all points as we were tempted, yet did not sin. The one who Paul says, and God commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. All nations shall hear the gospel preached. Multitudes will be converted and embrace faith in our Christ. Isn't that beautiful? It is not God's will, never has been, never will be. It is not God's will that any man should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. I, I feel the need to say that again for somebody. And you pass this on, look, don't, don't, don't look out of your house. Uh, first, consider your own brother, sister, your mother, your father, your children, your aunties, your uncles, uh, Pookie and Boo Boo and them. Uh, talk to them first. God does not want anybody to perish. The one using crack, the one selling crack. The one on meth, the one selling meth. The one on heroin, the one selling heroin. The one selling alcohol, the one using alcohol. The one who sleeps around, the adulterer, the fornicator, the effeminate, all that, those who are gay, straight, LGBT, whatever, our trouble may be, whatever our trials may be, God says, I don't want anybody to perish. The gospel is a message that everybody, every man, I don't care who you are, God wants everybody to hear the truth about Jesus Christ so that he or she can make up, decide personally for themselves if they will or they will not reject God's offer for salvation and then for sanctification and regeneration. Got it? You ain't got to fuss at nobody. You don't have to fight with nobody. You ain't got to preach no fire and brimstone down on nobody. Just Christian saints, child of God, can we just be faithful in sharing the good news of the gospel so that people can hear it preached, so that they can be converted and embrace Christ if they choose to do so? Now, now, church, come on. We we got the GRH here. We got to, we got to do one or the other. We got to stop talking and walking. On. We got to walk and talk. How do we expect the world to be changing if we're not doing what we are put in, left in the world to do and be? Huh? If what you work is not salty, how salty are you? If your community is not illuminated and lightful, then how, how much light are you being in that community? Got it? If there's not much conviction going on where we are in our communities and what's going on, then, then, then how faithful are we to preaching and teaching truth so that it can convict the heart of people? I love that word conviction. Don't you love it? It is a beautiful word. It is a word that means God makes the heart of the person open. God opens the heart of sinners. God reaches out young people. God reaches out children. God reaches anybody you consider to be a, a, a sinner and need salvation. You hear me, somebody? If you think they're not right, 
then if you've done what you're supposed to do, child of God, preacher, bishop, elder, apostle, church mother, youth director, small group leader, God says to the prophet Isaiah that I give you a citation. And that citation is that if you will preach the truth, he says, I promise you that the word will not return void, but it will accomplish what God desires. That's our clarion call. That's why I try to show up every week, and I don't do a good job every week, but at least I want to be, at least I want to show up and try to do my best to make the truth plain and to help people see that you have a choice to tell people who will listen. And, and look, you don't have to speak for me. Just tell somebody, invite somebody, share the Bible, study, link with someone, say, I think it's something you need to hear. Uh, Pastor Man always said this, and so I don't misquote him, so I don't put a, a bad slight on what he said. You just listen to him for yourself and see what you think. Somebody, right now, just go ahead and share the link, share the like. Let them hear this. God wants people to hear the good news of the gospel. He wants them to hear about Jesus. He wants this ancient message of the Messiah coming into the world as a sacrifice born of a virgin, raised in a little town uh, uh, called Nazareth, huh? Open blind eyes, made people walk, open people's ears, cut loose stammering tongues, fed multitudes, raised up dead people. Wow, made seas lay down and be still. Fed multitudes with two fish and five barley loaves. And one day stood at a grave of a man who had been dead four days, called his name, and the boy came back. <laughs> and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. But I ain't through. They need to know the story that one Friday they crucified this Messiah, this Jesus. Yes, they did. He died on a cross. Yes, he did. Just like the scripture says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, they took him down from that cross. They put him in a tomb. Joseph, he borrowed a grave. <laughs> Didn't have to keep it. He borrowed a grave. Stay there. And then on the third day morning, he got up. He was resurrected with all power in his hand, power to save, power to redeem. He took God Almighty, the sting away from death. He took the victory away from the grave. And then 40 days later, after a mission, uh, God tasked here on earth, speaking with last words to the 12 he had called, the 11 that are left because Judas hanged himself. He got on a cloud and went back to be at the right hand of God where he ever lives today to make intercession on our behalf. And one day, God help me, he's coming back again. And if somebody hadn't heard that, shame on us if people don't know the benefits of believing in this Christ that came into the world, that was spoke of, that this gospel needs to be preached to all nations. There's not just people you like. You don't, we don't supposed to just get people we like saved. Jesus died for everybody. People you don't even consider worthy. People you don't like. People we don't think measure up. Jesus died for them too. That's right, the one that lied on you. The one that cheated on, your, cheated, cheated on you with your husband. God loves them. The one that stabbed you in your back. God loves them. And they need to hear a message of the gospel so that they can have the opportunity to repent and be saved, have the gift of eternal life, and not be lost. I'll stop there. I'm sorry. I, I tried to get to verse 12. We'll, we'll start that next week. All right? Pray for me. <laughs> I, I love you. I, wow. I... I don't know what else to say. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine on you, be gracious to you. May our Lord's confidence shine so bright on you, you always experience his peace. Until next week, God bless you. I love you. And look, share the gospel because somebody needs to hear so that they can make a decision and have faith in Christ. 
God bless you. Good night. Pray for me.